right? Essentially, uh, the Supreme Court decided that they were going to vacate um, the, the, the NRO and reinstate these criminal charges, these corruption charges against them. And once the Supreme Court ruled that, in fact, uh, Zardari was, was culpable of this corruption, they had to oust him, and then they, they um, uh, excuse me, they, they uh, use this tool to basically play magic, uh, musical chairs with the prime ministership. So some of these, these instruments of putting pressure on the polity and then persuading the Supreme Court to intervene in what appeared to be um, fractious infighting among civilians served the military's purpose in a couple of ways. One, it continued to demonstrate that civilians are not to be trusted, that they're backbiting, that they only care about themselves, that um, they're only interested in being in power so that they can make money, that they're not interested in actually governing, that this is in fact elite capture dividing the spoils. And it also, um, and, and in doing so, it reconfirms amongst Pakistanis that the army is really the only game in town in terms of securing Pakistan's interests. But the way in which they did this, of course, was very different. It was through, um, in, in my belief, and, and there is some evidence of collusion between the Army Chief and the Supreme Court, but this is, this is what I'm arguing. And I see a very similar thing at play here. The Army had been gunning for Nawaz Sharif. And by the way, I'm really sorry, I'm jet lagged, is all out. I got in at 1 a.m., so if I look a little bit drunk, I assure you I'm not. <laughs> I'm just jet lagged, but you know, achy cheese, hey, really, it's the same thing as being, a, as being drunk. But if you, if you look at the relationship that Nawaz Sharif and the Army had, really since coming to power, he rankled them. And as you know, the Army has issues with Nawaz Sharif because he dared exercise his uh, prime ministerial constitutional prerogative in, ship, in, in switching out the Army chiefs when he ousted uh, Karamit and emplaced Musharraf. That was probably not the finest thinking on uh, Nawaz Sharif's part, but we can't accuse him of having fine thinking. Um, <laughs> So, but the Army has very strong memories. Um, not only did they try to oust, um, uh, not only did he uh, oust Karamit, he also then tried to exercise his constitutional prerogative again. And when he did so, you may recall that Musharraf was actually in a plane and there was no place to land. And so the Army understood this as an assassination attempt and actually put the coup into place while Musharraf was still very much in the air. Now, uh, Nawaz Sharif also has a long memory because he also remembers being exiled. And when he came into office, there were a couple of things that he had on his agenda. And I actually applauded um, the things that were on his agenda. But if you thought that he could have executed any of them, um, we all should be smoking what Nawaz why Sharif is said to sometimes smoke. But the issues at hand were very important. He had campaigned on a platform of making nice nice with India. He had also campaigned on a platform of abandoning strategic depth in Afghanistan. And he also wanted to hold Musharraf accountable for treason. Interestingly enough, Musharraf uh, con committed treason twice. One was in the coup, which we all know about, and the other was in the suspension of the Constitution in 2007. What I thought was interesting was that Musharraf didn't push the, the um, accountability for both acts of treason. In fact, I thought that was kind of surprising because the most obvious one was the coup. Instead, he went with the I would say the one that's less understood as a coup, which is the 2007 suspension of the Constitution. From the Army's point of view, having a former Army chief put on trial for treason, even though it wasn't for the coup, is just something that it wasn't going to accept. So it actually trotted out some of the same techniques that it used to, to hobble the Zardari government, which is, you know, again, dumb and dumber, uh, the, uh, the cleric and the cricketer, uh, to continue to shut down um, um, Islamabad to continue to gin up popular pressure against them. Um, and essentially, what ended up hamstringing Nawaz Sharif is one of those external events, um, sort of exogenous, that the army really had no control over, but which created an interesting opportunity to exploit, and that is, of course, the Panama leaks. Now, what's interesting, and um, Farzana Sheikh talked about this, what had happened was that there was a demand that Parliament look into 
the ways in which Nawaz Sharif was able to have these assets, because it's not illegal per se to have offshore assets. The question is how, when you're a public servant, can you afford these different assets? And Nawaz Sharif, um, not being a humble man, rejected that route. And so again, Dumb and Dumber come out, they put pressure on the streets, and uh, Nawaz Sharif and you know, basically acquiesces to have the Supreme Court put together this panel. And, uh, and in some sense, it was a technicality. So he was, the Supreme Court never actually tried him for corruption, right? So he, he was never proven to be corrupt. But as Farzana Sheikh explained, they exploited these highly um, dubious criteria for leadership that as she noted in 2014, the Supreme Court itself said had never been defined. And so this might be where Farzana and I again depart. I view this as the army is still struggling to find a way to keep democracy on a leash now that 58-2B, which was this Zia era instrument that allowed the president to dissolve the government. And from 88 um, up until, they didn't obviously do it in 99, I think it was 96 that they last did it with Benazir Bhutto. Um, what they would basically do is prevail upon the president to prorogue the government. And these parties were always complicit because uh, again, when you're in a sort of predatory democracy like this, what matters to you is not the institution of democracy itself, but rather your own opportunity to get to be a predatory leader. And so Nawaz Sharif did manage to get 58 2B removed in his second term, but then obviously Musharraf comes in with the coup and he reinstates it. So without 58 2B, the army is constrained. Without a viable alternative to either of the political parties, the army is constrained. Now, a lot of people suspect that the ISI is the one that was behind Imran Khan's really out of nowhere meteoric rise. But he's proven that he's really a political IED, right? He can't actually get to power without coalitions. Um, and for a while, the PTI had been renamed the Pakistani Turncoat Industry because it was bringing over large politicians, which importantly is also their vote banks. But he's not going to get to be prime minister on his own, right? So if you're going to be the army and you're going to bring democracy to heel, you need a couple of things. You need a way of not only bringing down the government, but you also need to be able to cobble together a coalition of the billing or coalition of the willing, probably the former, not the latter. So this was really a fortuitous opportunity. But, but let me say why this is actually not something that should be applauded. And, and here's where Farzana Sheikh and I will agree. Um, this is arbitrary, right? Who is Sadiq and Amin? If you're gonna look around Pakistan's political class and look for Sadiq and Amin, you may as well be looking for you know, broccoli at a halal butcher. You're not gonna find it. But the other reason why this is not to be celebrated because this is an arbitrary rule that can be used to bring down any civilian politician, and this is where we agree, the court has never held any of the generals to account. Has anyone asked where Musharraf got his money to have his flats in London and Dubai? Has anyone asked how the various army chiefs have accumulated their wealth? Watch some of the ISPR press releases that have been coming out saying, oh, these land plots, you know, this is all constitutional. Boy, it sure is curious how these, these uh, Falgies get incredibly valuable land, right? I, I, it, it, this is called, I think, constitutional corruption. But apart from the constitutional corruption, they also are engaging in nefarious activities. And I think um, Aisha Sadiqa's book, Military Inc., is, is perhaps the only effort to get data. Data on military businesses are, in fact, more difficult to obtain than information about Pakistan's nuclear program. So, inclusion, so in conclusion, when Pakistan's justices decide to take on the generals, maybe we can have something to be uh, celebrating. But in the meantime, this is just another tool the court has handed to allow the military to collude to bring down obviously imperfect, but nonetheless democratically elected governments. Thank you. Uh, Lawrence, you're going to talk to us about the institutions of, um uh, an institutional analysis of Pakistan. Yes, and I'm interested in, in some facets of Pakistan, but not necessarily domestic politics. Nonetheless, I was asked to speak on, on the 
on this specific topic uh, motivated by the removal of Nawaz Sharif. Um, initially, I thought actually it was uh, fake news because uh, nowadays you can't tell anymore what's real uh, in, in, in the news. It was only until Christine Fair was, was actually uh, commenting on it intelligently that I said, that I said well, it has to be true if, she, if, she, if, she's, if she's taking it seriously. Um, my initial reaction obviously, uh, now obviously, uh, was that um, it was a positive step. Uh, and I have changed that view uh, dramatically, um, m mostly on account of um, having read uh, many, many uh, more intelligent analysis of the situation and what led to, the, to his removal. I mean, obviously, uh, Nawaz Sharif, some people could con consider to be a, a benevolent crook, uh, but nonetheless, he was a crook, and that's one of the reasons why I, I, uh, I supported his ouster. Uh, but some of the, the comments that have been made uh, up, uh, up to now uh, support uh, a, a different perspective, typically uh, on the basis of whether or not it has an impact on democracy or the stability of democracy. And some people have, on the other hand, made an argument that it, it increases accountability uh, in the country. Um, I'm going to go over some, some, some slides to, to, show, to discuss what I consider the, the reasons why I have changed my mind on the specific topic. Typically. Uh, in, in political science, uh, we, we can uh, classify regime types uh, in terms of democracy, autocracy, which is more familiar to most people. Uh, but in, there's an intermediate uh, category that's rarely used outside of, of academia, uh, referred to as anocracies, which refer to mixed regimes that have both democratic and autocratic uh, elements. Uh, there is a uh, many ways of, of, of categorizing this, these, these, these political regime types, uh, but normally we will, uh, 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 or people like me who, who like to do the number crunching, uh, will rely on, on uh, uh, um, an index called Polity 4, which, which kind of analyzes, or at least it, it tries to analyze different countries over time in terms of what, what its level of democracy or autocracy may be over time. And so first, these are the authority trends for, for Pakistan. And it's, a, it's an example that I often use in my courses on South Asia because it is a, a well, and outside of South Asia, because it is a rather uh, peculiar pattern uh, of, of authority changes over time. Uh, the, the line, I don't have a, a low laser pointer, but essentially anything over, over uh, six in, in that specific uh, slide, which is pointed uh, at the top, uh, represents periods of democracy in Pakistan. And anything below uh, n uh, number six here uh, represents periods of authoritarianism or autocracy in, in, uh, in, 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 in Pakistan and other countries. And what is peculiar about Pakistan is that it has, over time, the periods of democracy have increased uh, from being one year to, two, uh, to a handful of years. And now uh, it's, it's been since 2013 classified as a, as a, a democracy, uh, an imperfect democracy as we all would agree. I think I can't imagine anybody who really would, would uh, think otherwise. Uh, it, it, the, the, the slide goes up to 2014, uh, but the latest uh, uh, policy for uh, categories uh, uh, specify Pakistan as being at number seven rather than a, a, a perfect democracy, which we uh, attend. Nonetheless, as imperfect as it is, uh, there's a concern about the specific developments that we were talking about uh, before. The other thing that's interesting about this specific slide is that uh, we noticed that there's periods of democracy that are short-lived, uh, initially especially, are punctuated by a drastic uh, turn to, to autocracy. Uh, the X's in, in there represent uh, coup d'etats, and so there are periods of uh, coups that, that emerge, and then uh, there's a, a, a quick uh, turn over to, to autocracy. This is a concern that most of us would face in terms of what the, the stability of Pakistan's democracy would be, should there be uh, a period of, of, of stability over time, uh, whether or not that actually will continue or, and then uh, be a return to, to some period of autocracy. The World Bank and uh, other similar institutions uh, have come up with new uh, governance indicators. I mean, the, I think the World Bank kind of makes an industry of, of developing a new index of, of governance. Uh, and some of the more common ones that, that we, uh, as a political economist, uh, come across are accountability, transparency as being a desirable outcome in, in, a, in a country, and the reverse, namely a lack of accountability or corruption uh, to be uh, a negative. Um, and typically, they will be uh, poised together, namely that democracy and accountability and transparency are one and the same, uh, or at least that they're the features of, of, a, of a true democracy. 
But I think that we could, uh, I would argue that uh, uh, Pakistan is, uh, has a, not unlike many other developing countries, and even developed countries, uh, uh, a, a tradition of having democracy, uh, the brief periods of democracy that, that we have described, but also the reverse, namely the lack of accountability and corruption being one of the, uh, the key features. And I think that one of the, the, uh, the things that, I mean, we should, I'm not sure is the reality is that that, that is the, the, the gap, and I think this is where um, perhaps the deep state has a, plays a role in having this disconnect between, on the one hand, uh, the possibility for democracy to take place in Pakistan, but at the same time having those uh, governance features of lack of accountability and, and corruption and being one of the permanent ones. There are many other countries, including, I would say, India, that has uh, similar features of democracy uh, combined with corruption. So I would propose that perhaps it's, it's best to think of Pakistan not so much in whether there's an increase or decrease of democracy uh, corresponding with an increase uh, of accountability or, or, or lack of corruption, uh, but that there are mixed, uh, the potential mixtures. Uh, so perhaps you could have a democracy that's corrupt. Uh, you may have a democracy that's accountable. Uh, and also, similarly, you may have an autocracy that's corrupt and in, in an autocracy that, that has some level of accountability. There are not many examples of uh, 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 autocracies that are accountable uh, or that it's like, you know, they, they have a lack of, of, of corruption, but I think perhaps the closest to that would be Singapore, which is a, uh, classified as a, a closed democracy, almost bordering on, on authoritarianism. Uh, but it still has, uh, at least on, on paper, uh, a very clean record and does very well in transparency uh, indices and, and lack of corruption indices. So you, it's possible to have a mixture of those. Clearly, the, 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 um, the events that we've been discussing uh, so far uh, could uh, possibly uh, damage uh, 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 democracy. I think I, I think I tend to agree with both of the previous speakers on, on this account. Uh, but also, this doesn't necessarily mean an increase in, in accountability. Uh, for the reasons that Christine Fair has just stated, namely that you have an independent judiciary, a person who made a very similar argument, uh, where, uh, which is unaccountable. And one of the suspicions that people who work on Pakistan or have uh, some idea of, of how the Pakistani regime operates is that it's very difficult to think of a situation where something would affect the, neg the military negatively uh, in the way that, that has been discussed. And so if you have a specific outcome, why is it, you know, who benefits from that specific uh, or who, who, who may have a, uh, an interest in making sure that this happens? So. Uh, one way to look at the the, uh, the Pakistani case is one in which you have bounded political regime types, namely you have anocracies, namely there are mixed regimes, uh, and it's possible that that should there be a continuation of the type of of, um, of I would say hypocrisy in, in terms of the the, uh, the 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 way in which the specific uh, uh, incident was 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 uh, uh, carried out. Uh, that they could return to some period of anocracy. That would be probably the best outcome, uh, rather than the complete uh, overhaul of its political system towards an autocracy, uh, motivated by a coup. So you have kind of bounded uh, political regime types of which Pakistan could uh, move, move towards. At the same time, you have uh, bounded governance indicators. I think that uh, it's very difficult to find countries that have completely clean and, and uncorrupt uh, institutions. I think, uh, uh, and, and I could really maybe a handful of, of, of cases of, of that type uh, or that have complete accountability uh, to, to its citizens. Um, so you have periods essentially kind of bounded uh, governance indicators where you have some selective corruption uh, or selective uh, uh, prosecution of corruption. I think that the, the, the Pakistani case uh, very much clearly falls into the category that it's, it's possible that you may have um, uh, corruption charge, and I think in the case of Nawaz Sharif, it's a, a situation possibly similar to people who driving on the motorway, and then you know the police stops one person, and then everybody else is speeding, but then the one person who gets caught uh, gets gets the the bulk of the of the punishment, and all the other people who are speeding on the motorway uh, do not. Uh, hopefully that's the case. I don't think that's the, likely to be the, the situation. Uh, I would like to see, uh, as, as Christine Fair has, has mentioned, uh, uh, political, uh, other political leaders in Pakistan, of which very few would probably meet any standard of, of accountability of, of, or, or lack of corruption that, uh, that we have uh, discussed, uh, but also in terms of the financial uh, assets of, of, um, of generals, as, as Christine has, has discussed. Why is this important? Why, why should we be concerned about uh, selective? I mean, it's, it's probably better to have, a, rather than a cor completely corrupt country, one that has some element of, of, of selective uh, corruption. I think there, there are two, two reasons for this. One is that um, 
in countries that you that have um, movements against corruption, many countries in, in the world have parties that are or, or movements that are anti-corruption movements. Initially, uh, they tend to fail uh, on ba basically because most people, um, even people who, who who are opposed to corruption, they oppose corruption uh, insofar as it doesn't it doesn't hurt them. And so, you know, people are, are quite keen to engage in corrupt activities if it benefits them. Then, on a broader basis, they say, "No, we, we hate corruption. We don't, you know, because typically they don't benefit from from that specific thing." And so, those movements tend to f uh, to fail away because uh, truly, most people prefer some level of corruption if they benefit from it. The problem with with the selective uh, accountability that I think is a feature of the Pakistani case is that it gives rise to um, to pot the potential for for um, you know, in, in some countries, a, a former billionaire or billionaire. From uh, completely uh, unprepared to, for for office to take uh, to be, to be elected to that, to that government, or uh, former cricket stars to be to be uh, elected to government, and so so it creates a, a, a cynicism in the population that that leads to this to these figureheads uh, to to stand out and to say that yeah I can I can clean up the government. Uh, they, they may not have the, the 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 preparation for 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 governance, but they they do have they speak very very uh, at least very directly as to why they should be the the, the leader. And so this you have this the problem with the um, with accountability, the lack of complete accountability, uh, giving rise to this type of of, of political. Uh, uh, People. Um, so, the, in general, I think that the the the, the final word on, on this, uh, as far as I'm concerned, also uh, it, uh, limits the, the 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 potential. I mean, I've been indoctrinated perhaps by having grown up in the United States, and, and I, I tend to believe in the the value of of institutions that kind of check and balance each other. Uh, obviously, in the case in, in of a completely dysfunctional uh, political system like Pakistan's. Uh, having an independent judiciary is a quite dangerous uh, weapon, uh, and, 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 and for the reasons that have been stated before, I don't want to repeat the, the type of arguments. But I think that it gives rise to the to an uh, unaccountable, unelectable, uh, unelected uh, body making decisions that ultimately have to uh, abide by the by the standards and the rules as set uh, out elsewhere, and I, I would say uh, by by the so-called deep state that that we've been discussing. Um, so that's it. Thank you so much. Uh, Fifteen minutes. Uh, we saw the break of Pakistan in 1971, which they couldn't hold the two nations together. Do we envisage any further break of Pakistan into different states? No. I mean, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that very, very firmly. This is an Indian dream, and it just <coughs> needs to be put to sleep. Um, Pakistan has many issues, but one of those issues is not that. Um, the Balochistan issue is really quite um, unfortunate. Um, the way in which the state treats Balochistan is reprehensible by any measure. Um, and I know that in, in India there's been a lot of discussion about exploiting those fissures. Um, that's, that's dangerous. And the reason for that is is that while Balochistan is about 40% of Pakistan's land mass, it has a lot of important um, resources that the state wants to and does exploit. It only has 5% of the population, and since we haven't had a, a census since 1998, the percentage of that small percentage who are Baloch is really quite small. I'll be very clear. The Pakistani state will kill every single Baloch who wants to get in the way of making that state safe for Chinese exploitation. And so, no, it will not um, break because the state is not a weak state. It's not even a failing state. What Pakistan does have is an ideology problem. So the objectives resolution that you spoke about really made a permanent job for the ulama because Pakistan, unlike Iran, doesn't have a consensus about what kind of sharia. The, there are at least five major musliks and they have serious and violent, violent arguments between them. But what Pakistan does need for it to be a, a state at peace with itself and its neighbors is a different ideology. Um, Islam as an ideology has proven to be a failure, mostly for Pakistanis. Um, not only did this decision presage that there was going to be a breakaway from Bangladesh because of the very large percentage of non-Muslim minorities there, it simply became an impossible state for non-Muslims. What we actually see is that the Deo Bundy murderers, and there's nothing else to call them, um, who first uh, turned their guns against Emadis and then Shia, they're now coming after Borelvis, right? So even in Afghanistan, where the uh, predominant strain of Islam is Naqshbandi Sufism, 
Even the Taliban didn't blow up worshipers and shrines. But the Pakistani Taliban do. So no, Pakistan isn't going to break up. That's an Indian fantasy that's being nursed. But what Pakistan is going to continue seeing is the death of tens of thousands of Pakistanis, not killed by raw agents, not killed by CIA or Mossad, that killed... Um, actually, we'll talk about drones. Yeah. I'm very happy to talk about drones. Um, that's a that's you're a very. Um, I'm the victim. You're actually not a victim well, if you're I'm here. I'm sorry. I'm that's that's brother called brother empirically. Brother. But we'll we'll come back to drones later. I'm happy. But I, I'm happy. Yes, absolutely. Not only that, you're not here, and I'm gonna bet. I'm gonna bet, sir. Your 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 accent is not remotely Pashtun. So I'm going to call the Bakvas flag, the Bakvaska agenda, on you. <laughs> so, you have to say something to me, please. But nonetheless, Yad, you're, you're actually, you're, your accent is not Pashto, Yad. I'm going to say something to you, what is it? My name is Dr. Shahid Qureshi. I'm a journalist based in London. I heard a lot of Pakistan bashing and military bashing and deep states. I just want to put things in perspective uh, for the audience and for yourself as well. Uh, since Briefly, not, please. I will be very brief. I'll be very brief. In, I just said, my name is Dr. Shahid Qureshi. I'm a journalist in London. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, in past 70 years, the total U.S. aid to Pakistan is about $30 billion. And what Pakistan had to suffer in the last 70 years is 3.5 million refugees in the first Afghan war. The, please, please, let, let me finish. Yes, let me finish, please. Let me finish, please. Let me finish, please. Okay, okay, okay. Coming to coming to the coming to the point now. The the U.S. U.S. Please, please. The U.S. is spending almost seven billion dollars a month in Afghanistan, according to the Foreign Policy magazine. Now, the NRO, which was signed by the uh, the corrupt politicians and the Musharraf government, was totally uh, endorsed by the U.S. and the U.K. government. Now, this is the shape of the democracy which people are, Pakistani people are facing. All the three major pol political politicians of Pakistan have assets in USA and UK, and they are protected by those various governments. Now, we are facing the, uh, the corrupt leadership, which is bent, which suits the international players, including the United States. And my colleague is totally deluded about uh, uh, what's it's going into the micromanagement of Pakistan, what's going to happen, what the Indians are doing, or what the uh, Chinese are going to do away. The importance is the credibility as an academic and as a, as a writer, as a journalist. What I was f failing to understand was that you totally ignored the international uh, players uh, doing in Pakistan. Pakistan is a siege problem. Pakistan is surrounded by the, uh, the USA in Afghanistan, the uh, Indians on the other side. Uh, this is an automatic reaction that the Pakistani military is very sensitive about it. Now, you want to play democracy. Your democracy has killed more than 2 million people in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in uh, Syria, and Libya. So that is your democracy. And I want to show, uh, I want to show you okay, the real you, face. Thank you very real, much. Can you, can you finish up? OK. Now, my, my final question is that when you, sorry, the you final question is. Can you please sit down? Thank you.